Hello and welcome to this podcast on airway and breathing, which is part of the pre-hospital care series. My name's Dr. Cosmo Scar. Again, with our approach in all pre-hospital care scenarios, you use the doctor A, B, C, D, E approach. And remember that scene assessment will give you clues as to likely pathology and what is wrong with the patient. And then the response of the patient will also give you further clues as to what is going on and how serious the situation is. The first thing we're going to talk about is the airway emergencies. And the approach to this, as always, is to look at the scene to ascertain information from that, then take a history and then to examine the patient. When assessing the scene, you can look at information which will give you information on trauma patients, but also on medical patients. So when thinking about the airway, you want to look if there's any fire damage or any smoke, which would give you a clue that there could possibly be swelling of the airway, or if there's any damage to the vehicle in an area which might mean that there had been damage to the neck. You also want to look around the patient in non-trauma patients for things such as inhalers or medications that may give you a clue as to asthma or any toxic materials or food packaging lying around that could show that the patient is either choking or having an allergic reaction. You then take a history and in pre-hospital care you have three avenues of history information. The first is the information given on dispatch by the ambulance service. Then there's the information from bystanders and other services on scene. And then there's the information from the patient and their family. When examining the patient and thinking about airway emergencies, the first thing, as always, is can the patient respond? And of course, if the patient is unresponsive, then you need to move into your ALS or BLS approach to see if they are in fact breathing at all. If they are partly responsive, then you move on to is the sound of the breathing normal? And you need to look for wheeze or stridor or an abnormal voice if they're able to talk. And this can give you clues as to whether there has been damage or swelling to the airway and whether you're at risk of soon losing the airway, which may change your response and your response time. You then need to look at the neck. Is there any sign of burning or soot around the nasal passages, which gives you clues as to burns and burn injury and inhaled hot gases, which are often at risk of sudden loss of the airway due to airway swelling? And is there any swelling or bruising around the neck that you can see, which again would give you clues that you're about to lose the airway? So this is the approach to airway emergencies and below we'll look at some of the different airway emergencies and how we manage these. As you can see there's dealing with unresponsive casualties, there's dealing with obvious airway damage and there's dealing with airway narrowing. With an unresponsive casualty you become responsible for managing their airway. Now if the patient is managing to maintain their airway and they're just unconscious, you may find that putting them into the recovery position is appropriate so that they're on their side and not at risk of vomiting and obstructing their own airway. But in this case, the patient is at risk of their GCS falling further and you may find that they lose control of their airway and obstruct. So you need to have suction available, you need to have proper airway equipment ready and you need to be assessing them regularly to make sure that they're not losing their airway and you should be moving them rapidly to hospital. If they are in need of airway assistance and they're not able to maintain an airway, if the airway is unsafe, then you'll need to intervene. And there are multiple ways of controlling or at least assisting with an airway as learnt in anaesthetics. You have the basic airway manoeuvres, which in trauma would usually only involve a jaw thrust as you want to keep the cervical spine stable, but may also involve a head tilt and a chin lift in non-trauma patients to open the airway as much as possible. Sometimes a patient can have their airway held just by these good manoeuvres alone, but you may also need to use nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal airways. The critical thing to avoid is not to use a nasopharyngeal airway in a trauma patient if there's any risk of a base of skull fracture as you have to insert this blindly and want it to go down the airway rather than through any basal skull fractures. <laughs>
You can also use supraglottic airways such as an LMA or supraglottic device such as a combi tube if you're trained in using these sorts of things. And the final thing that you can do to manage an airway definitively is to be doing tracheal intubation which should only be done if fully qualified and insured for such a procedure. Airway damage is another major cause of airway risk and airway emergency and this can often be after trauma to the face, teeth or neck. The important thing to do is in patients who are conscious and maintaining their own airway is not to intervene and possibly make a situation worse. So if the patient is sat up, has found a position that they are able to breathe with, you should allow them to stay in that position and get them to hospital as quickly as possible. If they need help positioning themselves then you can do that for them. If they're unconscious then you may need to try and create or help with that airway and then suction is often very important if there's bleeding or vomitus in the airway and you need to appropriately position them possibly with the recovery position if that's appropriate. You may then need to use the airway control measure talked about before such as intubation to give yourself a definitive and secure airway but all of these are major emergencies and if you can't definitively intervene then you should either have people on their way who can or the patient should be moving rapidly to hospital. Airway narrowing is fairly common and very dangerous for patients and this can be caused by a multitude of things, the most common of which are anaphylaxis, angioedema and burns causing swelling to the airway. And this is treated as seen on the slide with adrenaline and hydrocortisone if needed, as well as supplemental oxygen and considering early tracheal intubation in patients where the airway is swelling, so that even if they haven't yet lost the airway, they may become very difficult to manage shortly. Next we'll talk about breathing emergencies, which are again approached in a similar way to the airway emergencies, with scene assessment, followed by history and followed by examination. Again, looking at the scene in both the trauma and non-trauma patient, you can find clues as to what has caused the difficulty and this will give you ideas as to how to treat the patient. But if you find a patient who has nebulizers and inhalers, this may give you a clue that their patient has asthma or COPD and gives you an idea as to why they're in respiratory distress. Again, the history comes from information given on dispatch, information from bystanders and the other services on scene, and information from the patient. And examining the patient is like examining a patient in hospital. You look for medical and trauma causes of respiratory distress and then treat these as appropriate. But some of the most important things to find are the respiratory rate, which gives you an idea to the respiratory distress, if there's any wheeze which tells you about airway narrowing and whether there's any possibility of pneumothorax which can be found from a good clinical examination. These are some of the different respiratory or breathing emergencies and these include respiratory arrest and tachypnea. Respiratory arrest requires an ALS or an ATLS approach depending on the cause of this arrest. But as it says here, you need to make sure help is on the way. You then control the airway to the best of your ability and training, give supplemental oxygenation and control the cervical spine if needed. A patient who is not breathing or not breathing enough, less than 10 breaths per minute, may well need supplemental ventilation which can be done with a bag valve mask or by intubation. And if they're also in cardiac arrest, they may well need CPR and defibrillation as appropriate. And as always, you need to look for reversible causes of this respiratory arrest. Tachypnea is a very sensitive sign and can be caused by a multitude of things, but often gives a clue as to a breathing emergency. And some of the major things which are seen in pre-hospital care are pulmonary edema, pneumonia and asthma and COPD where there's airway narrowing.
These things can be treated in the same way as being treated in hospital, but the important things are they need to be given oxygen as appropriate and based on their saturations, and they also need to be reassured and taken to hospital rapidly. You should also make sure that there aren't other medical conditions underlying this, such as arrhythmias causing pulmonary edema, and to treat these as appropriate, as well as treating the breathing emergency. Chest trauma is an important aspect of pre-hospital care, and this is one of the areas where the safe approach and scene appreciation are very important, as talked about in the Dangers podcast. An ATLS approach is often used, and then you approach with danger, response, airway breathing and circulation. You need to clinically examine the patient, find out what is wrong with them, and get them to hospital quickly. Another important topic to talk about is appropriate use of oxygen. And this has changed in pre-hospital care in recent years, where in the old days, oxygen was given for almost any medical emergency. But now there really are only two indications for oxygen in pre-hospital care. One of these is hypoxia, and the other is people who are at risk of ABC compromise. Hypoxia is measured low oxygen saturations which are inappropriate for the patient. So a patient without underlying lung disease should have saturations above 95% and if the saturations are lower than this may well need supplemental oxygen. A patient who has got normal oxygen saturations does not need oxygen unless they fulfill the other criteria for oxygen replacement. And the other criteria for oxygen supplementation are patients who are at risk of deteriorating in terms of their A, B and C. As you can see here, there are some examples of medical and trauma patients who may well be at risk of deteriorating further and so may well need to have extra oxygen even if their saturations are currently normal. On the trauma side, you can see that burns or other causes of airway swelling may mean that a patient should have extra oxygen in case they lose their airway and this will buy you time in treating them if that happens. Also patients who are at high risk of hypovolemia or cardiac arrest due to blood loss may well benefit from extra oxygen to effectively pre-oxygenate them. And also patients who are tiring with their ventilation who may well be currently tachypneic with acceptable saturations could be at risk of tiring dropping their ventilatory rate and then dropping their saturations and it may be worth giving them extra oxygen even if their saturations are normal. On the left you see some medical causes such as anaphylaxis or severe asthma where extra oxygen can be valuable if the patient may deteriorate further. So this was an overview of airways and breathing in some of the emergencies and you can read in detail about the treatment of these emergencies, but this gives you an approach to them that can be used in pre-hospital care.